Yeah, welcome everybody. It's great to see you all. Uh, like Claire said, my name is uh, Zach Coper. Um, I work for Git and in GitHub and outside of GitHub, I uh, focus a lot on uh, open source and inner source, uh, as well as uh, software security. Those are sort of my three legs of the stool of my career. Um, so I'm, like I said, currently a senior software engineer at GitHub. Um, my day job can public sector customers or government customers in the uh, United States and helping them to um, accomplish their goals around inner source, uh, open source and security initiatives. So uh, today we're going to be talking about inner source and government. So I'm excited to talk to you about this today. It's uh, close to my heart and it's, it's actually my job um, as I was talking about earlier. So specifically, we'll kind of get into the potential that inner source has in government as well as uh, some of the obstacles. So uh, the way I want to start this is actually by opening it up with uh, this question of is inner source in government even possible? So this question, um, it comes up a lot uh, because most governments, um, which have a lot of different things to do, um, you know, in governing a, a, a body or nation state or a, a city a territory, um, and often, at least at the um, uh, larger levels of government, there's this, um, you know, military is a part of that, and there's this militaristic model of command and control. Um, and if you look at um, at the tech industry as a whole, it's sort of gone with this shared services hierarchy in terms of how they architect the way that software works. Um, and, and then if you look at the governments with their command and control model, uh, it can create deep silos. And so it's, it's very, very different, two different uh, operating models, if you will. Um, so if you aren't familiar with the term command and control, just explain that a little bit. It, it means that there's a clear hierarchy um, of authority or a, or a chain of command. So think about that triangle of an org chart. There's a, a CEO, a president, a, you know, a director, a secretary, um, whatever the, the title is. And then there are uh, subordinate leaders under that and subordinates under that and so on and so forth, filling out the triangle. Um, and so uh, you can imagine that if there's um, you know, two folks on the bottom of that triangle that they report up through different reporting chains um, and they're, they're not on the same team, but maybe they're doing the same job, but for a different part of that uh, government department. Um, so uh, those two folks, while they have a lot in common, a lot to share, possibly even um, you know, uh, shared inner source that they could be working on together to reduce their, you know, amount of rewriting the same thing, the same code, um, they, they don't have the networking or the organizational structure to really support that. Um, and whereas the shared services where folks are all grouped based sort of on what they do and they service the entire organization um, would, be, would be the opposite of that. And there's actually a good amount written if you just look up in the in the government space about the benefits of decentralizing that command instead of having to go up the chain and then back down the chain on the other side. Uh, this is something that the private industry is currently sort of undergoing this, you know, some call it a digital transformation, organizational transformation um, to move towards more of a shared services model. Um, both models that I'm, I'm talking about here are sort of extremes, so keep that in mind. Um, but uh, you know, a balance is probably probably best. Um, so uh, returning to sort of the, I've laid that context, returning to the question of is inner sourcing government even possible? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, but let's talk about some examples to, to prove that claim. So on a small scale uh, inside a single US agency, or at least what I consider a small scale, I understand that's relative to folks. Um, there's a uh, notification system uh, called VA Notify, obviously a part of the Department of Veterans Affairs um, in uh, the US government. And they have intersourced a notification system uh, for all of their products and services. Um, so they've done this to save money. Um, they're not spending tax dollars on recreating a notification system for each of their products, but rather just creating one central one that works for everyone and then um, servicing that out, right? So this is an example of that balance I'm talking about of a services 
uh, shared services model in a command and control type of organization. Um, on, does the scale though, right? Uh, so from a large scale, you look at US platform one, um, and again, my experience is with the US government. So this is very US centric and the examples, um, this is actually happening all over the world. So, um, you know, just know that that context is out there um, and, and it's much, much greater than just US. Um, so uh, US platform one is a, it's a DevSecOps uh, software factory that's been intersourced, not just across a single agency in the US government, but actually the entire US government. So all of the agencies in the US government have access to this. And it's not just code either that they're sharing. They're actually sharing training around how to implement and use the code. They have an entire support community around it. And there's continuous development of that software um, as folks use it. So they're uh, versioning and, and updating that. Um, you can see the on the left here, the US Department of Veterans Affairs logo. And then on the right, that's the platform one uh, logo. I think they have a little um, little Yoda figure, Grogu figure there, which is kind of cute. So um, there's a there's a third type too. So talking about large scale and small scale, but there's also um, you can't really talk about inner source without mentioning open source, or at least I can't. Um, and and so um, there are projects like uh, Code.gov, which is actually the U.S. government's project to um, catalog all of the open source across all of the. Um, uh, federal government. And so they are um, doing this for transparency, but also for um, the purpose of reuse. So they're inner sourcing for the purpose of reusing code and not writing it multiple times. And they're also looking at their open source and saying, well, what open source does other government agencies use? Here's a catalog of all of it, actually. And, um, you know, consider that for reuse as well. So all that to say, inner sourcing government is possible at a small and a large scale, um, whether it's based off of open source or it's uh, strictly private as inner source. Um, so taking a, a shift a little bit of to, okay, does this even happen? Is it even worth talking about? Well, why would we do it? Why would we inner source in government? And uh, maybe uh, you folks are all inner source believers and, and you, um, you know, sort of understand the benefits. Well, I would uh, ask you to use sort of this discussion as a way to consider what points you're making to your leadership and those that you need to convince to buy in to inner source. Um, a couple different things we'll look at, engineering efficiency and its economic impact for governments, uh, because governments are uh, of such large scale, the economic impacts can be huge. Um, We'll take a look at community and um, and the sort of poetry of uh, governing a community uh, in a community driven way. And then also the transparency factor, the transparency that this offers the governed body of the government, um, which is really important to create trust in the government, which is important uh, for you know security reasons and uh, for stability of government. And, um, and peace in, in, a, in a nation, state, or city. So um, starting with engineering efficiency um, and economic impact, you kind of can't talk about one without the other. Um, for America, at least, in, uh, there was a Gallup poll in 2009 where um, the perception of Americans was that 50% of the government funding, you know, revenue from tax dollars and whatnot, uh, actually goes to what they would categorize as government waste. And so um, the, um, the US, if you, if you think about that, just keep that in your mind, 50%. Uh, in 2021, the US budgeted $92.2 billion for IT spending. So uh, half of that going to, to waste, at least as perceived by the constituents, is, is really interesting. Um, a, a more efficient government organization could, could lead to, again, like I mentioned, significant economic impact. Uh, if you think about that 92 billion number and there's a perceived half of it that could be uh, taken out um, if things were more efficient. So huge potential um, here in terms of um, economic impact, in terms of the government um, uh, being seen as efficient, which ultimately, again, leads back to uh, trust of the government and and their fiscal responsibility. Um, 
So uh, a, a common source of this waste though is rework to tie this back to open source. Um, so it, it rework happens more easily in large organizations and governments tend to be larger than corporations, uh, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with. And, um, and so something needs to be done to sort of work against this. Otherwise, as the government gets larger, grows, um, or just increases over time, sort of natural scope creep, um, the, the more and more rework is going to happen, more and more waste um, in the software space. And so normally in a private sector organization, software architects are responsible for identifying opportunities for consolidating um, and uh, opportunities for sharing and intersourcing. Uh, but what happens when, again, if we think about this in the context of that structure and hierarchy, what happens if you have a software architect in this wing of the government over here and their purview is limited? Well, they don't have the perspective or the right vantage point to be able to see opportunities over here in the org chart because that's not their projects. Um, and often those projects are on a need to know basis, right? So not everybody is in the government is just making everything transparent and, and aware. Um, so things get missed um, is ultimately what that turns into. And um, you know, a key way to increase the efficiency for government software organizations is, is to um, sort of create this searchable catalog of existing software internal. So you're not sharing it to those that shouldn't see it um, for those things that shouldn't be open source. Um, but, and then also incorporating a way to be able to search this database of, of existing solutions before implementing a new one, right? So I've seen many organizations and many governments that will create this body of work. Hey, there's all this, these reusable things, but then when they go to start off a new initiative or a new service um, to the people, then they, they, you know, take the normal process. They estimate the work, they engineer it, and then they release it. And, uh, you know, and that's often through contractors and other folks. And so that contract is awarded, it's completed, and it's done. And um, they're not actually looking at that body of work. So both of those things are really important. Um, so that's engineering efficiency and economic impact. But let's take a look at, uh, you know, community as a core practice of government. So uh, I mentioned before, this is kind of poetic that governments are tasked with governing a nation state, locality, whatever it is, um, which consists of a group of people. It's a community that they're governing. Now they're also protecting those folks um, and uh, writing laws for those folks. So there are lots of different pieces of government. I don't mean to reduce it, but uh, part of that is that they're governing a community. Um, and uh, that community in democracy has a say in how the government runs, if that's running correctly, right? Um, and so in, in the same way that democracy allows for the organization of the folks um, being governed um, with similar interests, so let's say there's folks that think that the government should uh, do more in terms of you know, helping out underprivileged folks. Um, well, those folks in democracy can you know, learn about each other, they can organize and they can lobby the government to do something about it um, and, uh, you know, write their representatives, all that sort of thing. Um, and so inner source communities can also enable that for government. If you think about what communities exist inside of government to serve a certain purpose. So I have a couple of examples that I'll talk about. Um, here are three of them actually. And these are communities that I've set up in different um, US government agencies and even across agencies in some cases that have been really effective at creating inner source and creating community driven inner source, right? So these aren't things that some architect somewhere in some department, you know, in some basement is writing, thinking everybody's gonna reuse it. These are things that the community has come together and said, I could really use this. And then they developed it together. Um, and so the three different communities that um, I focused on starting are uh, first off a security community of practice. And the security community is um, from you know, developers and software security experts that are interested in securing the government software, making sure that it doesn't you know, become vulnerable and things like that. And so um, there's also a inner source community, just folks who are trying to manage inner source projects. 
as well as a software architecture community of practice. And so that that can, like I talked about earlier, increase the visibility to do this consolidation and identify where intersource can happen. So the community of practice model, if you're not familiar with it, normally I set up a Slack channel, set up monthly calls, I set up a shared repo or backlog, um, and then make announcements um, uh, via Slack or, or newsletter to the entire government agency. So for example, um, in the intersource community of practice inside the um, Department of Veterans Affairs recently, we just expanded um, from 12 projects of inner source curated projects to 23. And so we made a big announcement about these new projects and, and told everybody about it to kind of gain that awareness. Um, and then let's look at the last point real quickly of transparency. So um, transparency in government is a tricky topic. Um, normally folks outside the government want transparency, folks inside the government um, understand why transparency isn't always an option. Um, and so there's sort of this tension. Um, well, inner source and open source can provide a fantastic amount of transparency into code, into processes, into technologies, um, and even into strategies. And so governments have traditionally been plagued by an over-reliance on the principle of least privilege, which has its place and is important, but can be taken to the extreme. Um, and so there are some things in government that are better if they're transparent. Um, they can, like I said, create trust and uh, don't compromise or risk much by sharing them. So it's a difficult culture change to go from that over-reliance on you know, the principle of least privilege to more of a sharing. But I think it's important for folks to understand that it's not like, oh, the government's going to open everything, the community can see everything that's happening, sometimes even for security reasons, that's just not going to be uh, feasible. So uh, if you consider how this might be applied to inner source, though, you know, some things may be fully shared within a government organization, some things maybe need to be targetedly shared to people with certain clearance or things like that. Um, so one thing that I encourage folks to do too, just as a tangible um, uh, action item is to is to consider posting a framework to make these decisions about what's appropriate to share and with whom in your inner source documentation. So if your government organization has an inner source repo, document the decision points about how the organization should decide what's shareable or not. Um, and then yeah, some things just never change. Uh, this is one of my favorite comics actually related to open source and inner source. There's the folks with the square wheels trying to take the rocks, you know, uh, from one location to another. And they just say, uh, oh, no, thanks. We're too busy. We, we don't have time to install this upgrade of round wheels because, you know, we've got to keep doing this and it's a lot of hard work. Well, they don't realize if they just took the time, the short term investment to be able to look at these um, this new technology or this new way of working then uh, obviously they'd be a lot more efficient and in the long term do a lot. So these, these are um, a list of things that I hear all the time um, in reference to why inner source isn't going to work. And this is in government and anywhere, but not enough time, no leadership buy-in. Oh, we have separate organizations. So we don't even have the ability to have the, the visibility into what's going on. You know, nothing, nothing is modular. We only write our code or contractors only write our code in, you know, uh, monoliths. And so we can't reuse things um, or there's just too much tech debt and sharing is vulnerable. So my advice to you on this is actually turn these obstacles into motivators. Okay. So a couple examples. Uh, oh, there's not enough time to do this inner source sharing thing. Like we've got deadlines. Well, if, again, you look at the comic, you can realize that there's no time to waste. Uh, you know, if we make the short-term investment, it'll pay off by this date. And then from there, we're actually making up time and operating in a faster way. Um, and that's important to see. Governments are long-standing, if they're done well, they're, they're long-standing institutions. And so they have the opportunity to make short-term investment for uh, very long-term gains. Um, so uh, there's no leadership buy-in um, for inner source. Well, take, take the opportunity to make an impact. So you're switching this from a, a complaint into a, into a motivator or, um, well, there's you know, too much tech debt. 
that's one of my favorite ones to talk about because, well, the the idea that somebody else would put eyes on your code um, normally motivates developers to clean up their code, to write documentation for it. And so there can be this great side effect of like, well, if we can't intersource because there's too much tech debt, start telling folks, okay, we're going to intersource. And the consequence of that is, is that some of this stuff needs to get cleaned up cleaned up. And it's not like that's cleaned up um, for a bad thing. Cleaning up projects finds bugs and, and um, things like that, as well as makes it easier for people to onboard. So you are getting a benefit out of this. Um, but yeah, it just becomes a problem obsessed paralysis if you let folks continue to talk about um, all of the obstacles uh, without moving into a solution-oriented momentum. Um, so either way, if you think about it, energy is spent. Energy is spent talking about all of the issues or energy can be spent overcoming those issues. So only one of those two options gets you into a better state of being though. Um, and a lot of times when I share folks, share that with folks that um, maybe are particularly uh, adept at um, you know, bringing up issues, um, then they, they sort of have to chew on that for a while. <laughs> So um, I talked a lot about kind of some high level stuff. I just wanted to give you a few quick actionables. Um, so if we look at um, some you know, takeaways, for example, um, you can present uh, the future state to inspire folks uh, with your vision for a more efficient, a more transparent government, a more fill in the blank of whatever um, you know, your, your goal is, uh, and really align that future state with whatever the mission of the agency is. Um, some next steps too, you can, you can outline tangible um, next steps so that folks that are motivated by that vision that you give them of a more efficient government, a more transparent government, can actually know how to contribute. How can they contribute to making that happen? This effectively like crowdsources your effort. Um, uh, like I mentioned already, aligning to the agency's or, or government's goals or strategy. If transparency is a goal, if efficiency is a goal, if X is a goal, uh, make your inner source about that and guide your inner source projects to be able to, um, to be aligned with that goal. Um, finding champions is huge um, in leadership on the ground. You need champions at all levels for inner source. Um, so literally wherever you can find them, um, and then also document your, your progress and don't afraid to be vocal. Normally sort of uh, broadcasting out messages all across the government agency is sort of frowned upon and can be a very vulnerable thing. Um, but uh, if you've got the leadership support, then you've got to communicate so that, um, you know, I think about it this way in the reverse. Can you think of a way that Intersource could be successful in a government, but no one knows about it? Okay, well, if everyone's got to know about it, then somebody's got to tell them. And that's, you know, sort of the impetus for getting the message out. Um, and then, you know, so if you want to impact delivery speed of the software in your uh, government or the bug fixes in your, um, you know, government software, then measure that and measure how inner source is affecting that. So uh, thanks for your time in considering my very US centric uh, experience. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to bring governments deeper into their inner source practice. And I hope that sharing that with you folks has sort of stimulated some ideas, questions um, so that we can have um, a productive discussion about it. Um, yeah, I'm excited to move into the, the discussion portion. Um, Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, and uh, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. 